So welcome to the MLOps Live webinar series, the place where we talk about bringing data science to production and seeing real business value from your AI and AI initiatives. I'm really happy to see all of you here with us today. We have a fantastic session coming up. My name is Edith, and I'm the head of community and open source marketing here at Aguasio, an AI startup that was acquired by McKinsey in 2023. Today, we're gonna to be talking about deploying Gen AI in production with NVIDIA NIM and MLRun. I'm excited to welcome some incredible speakers, starting off with Amit Leweis, a senior data scientist at NVIDIA to our webinar. He will start off by talking about the Gen AI journey enterprises are experiencing today, how to build, customize, and deploy Gen AI models with different NVIDIA microservices, and how to overcome common challenges in the market. Next, we're pleased to have Yaron Khaviv, co-founder and CTO of Iguazio, back with us after a bit of a break. And Yaron will discuss what it takes to productize Gen AI applications, Gen AI reference architecture, he'll show us some examples, and he'll also discuss how NVIDIA and Iguazio work together in our joint solution. Following that, a last minute surprise guest, Guy Lecker, machine learning engineer team lead, <laughs> An expert demo presenter at Aguazio will show us a live demo of an e-commerce Gen AI application. And then we'll jump into the live Q&A. So before we begin, a few housekeeping items. This webinar will be recorded and a link will be sent to you afterwards. So there is no need to worry if you miss anything. We have a lot to cover. As always, we'll be taking your questions live, which is often one of the most engaging parts of these webinars. So to ensure we don't miss any of your questions, please do use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen throughout the session, and we'll do our very best to address as many questions as possible. Additionally, we'll be running two polls during the session. Your participation is valuable in helping us improve these webinars, and don't worry, we'll share the results live. We also invite you to join our MLOps Live community where the conversation will continue after the session, and we'll be available to answer any further questions you may have. Please note that everybody is now on mute and the session is being recorded so we can share it with you afterwards. And anyone that wants to request to get the slides afterwards, please do email me um, and we'll share my email address in the chat now. So without further ado, I am pleased to invite Amit to kick things off. Thank you, Edith. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. So, as far as the, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, NIM, NVIDIA Inference Microservices. And um, first, let's talk a little bit about the background and where we stand today. So there's a lot of hype on generative AI. And uh, many of you have probably seen the hype specifically on large language models, LLMs. Um, and it's taking a little bit of a historical perspective. In 2022, uh, we saw the explosion of generative AI and specifically chat GPT. Um, with a lot of new users and, and being introduced to the concept of LLMs. And then 2023, we might, the, the whole enterprise uh, and uh, ecosystem migrated to an experimentation stage where various developers were um, taking large language models, perhaps customizing them, mostly doing a lot of prompt engineering. And now this year in 2024, we're in the year of production. So we're seeing teams actually taking it to the next level and uh, moving to production. And we know that there is a big um, challenge moving from experimentation research uh, in AI in general to production. Um, so how do we address these needs? So at NVIDIA, we have uh, a, a full end-to-end -end pipeline for building generative AI applications. And uh, NVIDIA NIM is part of that uh, as far as the deployment. But if we look at the end-to-end -end flow, we start with data preparation. Uh, we move on, on to training and customizing the model. More often for enterprises today is customizing and tuning as opposed to full uh, training, which was more common, uh, let's say five years ago. And then finally to deployment and monitoring. So if we look at the data prep stage, that's actually one of the mo most challenging stages today because we have plenty of great open source large language models available um, in the market. Uh, many are domain specific. But we still need to tune them for our specific use case, perhaps for a low resource language and so on. So a lot of the challenge uh, is over here in the data prep stage. Uh, then we move on to customization and training. Um, so as I as mentioned before, 
perhaps uh, it's it's not enough to use an open source LM model. So once we curate and prepare the data, we're able to now customize um, and take this model and basically tune it for our needs. Uh, then we have an evaluation stage, where which is very important today. It's not like trying in the past where we have a single metric. We often have multiple very complex metrics that we want to keep track of as we develop our model, as we tune our model for our domain and for our needs. And hence, evaluation is very important. Um, so all these, these first three stages are handled by uh, NEMO, uh, which is our tool for training. Um, and then NVIDIA NIM, which will be the focus for today, is the stage where we actually go and deploy um, th this prepared model, deploy it on the cloud or on-prem. And perhaps the next thing we want to do is connect this to RAG. So we have retrieval tools for that as well, for embeddings and so on, to connecting to existing databases. Uh, because we know large language models are not uh, enough as just vanilla pieces. We need to connect them usually to some uh, data store and to some uh, specific um, information that we want to query. And then finally, uh, as we move on to monitoring, we have um, guardrails also as, as far as the NEMO offering. So how does NIM fit in with this uh, pipeline? We start with a foundation model. Usually, as I said, the focus of most enterprises is not on full pre-training, um, but rather on customization. And we have several uh, tools for customizing with NVIDIA NEMO. Um, so we can take an open source model, let's say a Llama 3, and then fine tune it again on the data we curated. Um, we can use LoRa, supervised fine tuning, or any of the other popular technique, techniques that are well known today. These are all supported. Um, and then we take uh, this information and we can add that onto the NIM, or we can use existing NIMs out the box uh, if we don't need tuning. Um, we can also connect NIM to uh, an external database uh, via a, a RAG and an embedding model. And finally, we connect our application to NIM. So that gives you kind of a high level uh, perspective of where NIM fits in uh, as far as the overall application lifecycle. Now, uh, when we talk about moving to production, one of the key questions is, am I going to use a managed service via an API, let's say an open AI, um, or am I going to self-deploy? So am I going to take the model and serve it myself uh, and then have full control? There are pros and cons for both. Um, if we use uh, this AI service, a managed service, then we have easy to use APIs, right? Like the OpenAI API. And we can, we have a really fast path to get started. We don't need to set up uh, containers or, or uh, set up any infrastructure. On the other hand, we are limited in the sense that um, we're limited to what this environment provides us. Um, so perhaps if we wanna do some complex tuning, uh, we'll be limited by that. Um, and also we have to remember the cost, right? So usually with these managed services, we're paying per inference and that might not bit make business sense for, for some use cases, for some enterprises. So in that case, it'll make more sense to move to um, this do-it-yourself deployment, um, which is essentially deploying the model by yourself uh, in a data center. Uh, perhaps you may want to do it on-prem. So uh, if you have data, which is... Uh, uh, sensitive to privacy, or you want to securely manage it, um, you don't have the option of running through a managed AI service, and you have to do it yourself, right? Uh, perhaps you're, let's say, in a hospital setting where you want to run it on-prem. So again, you, you, you need to go with this right-hand option with do-it-yourself deployment. And that's one of the benefits of NIMS is that you can easily, with basically one line of code, just deploy um, any of the models um, in any environment you like, on-prem, on the cloud, and you have full control. So what is a NIM? What is, what is the, the, uh, the basically the architecture of a NIM? So it comes with industry standard APIs. We don't have our own APIs. So we actually support uh, OpenAI and other industry standards. It comes with a pre-built container and Helm chart, so you can deploy it in Kubernetes. Uh, it comes for support for custom models. So if you want to take the existing NIM, let's say a Llama 3 again, and use it with a lower tuned version, we have uh, the ability to cache adapters uh, with these names as well. So you have uh, that flexibility. Um, and very importantly, we have optimized inference engines. So each one of these models 
Um, it's quite different from, let's say, going to Hugging Fist and just downloading the model. Here, um, you know, our teams internally did very specific work to fully optimize these for GPUs. And I'll just I'll, I'll discuss that a little bit in more in detail in the upcoming slides. So NIM, basically, if you go to uh, build.nvidia.com, you'll see um, a catalog of models. Uh, this is our API catalog. And you could just start by prototyping. We have a user interface where you could just pull up these models and directly uh, run queries or input images and just see live uh, uh, results via UI. Um, we also have a simple API where you can use our endpoints to just um, quickly prototype or evaluate in a playground type setting. And then if you're happy with your experimentation, you can deploy the NIMS and then run them on your own uh, cloud or on-prem. But the, the benefit of prototyping using just an endpoint um, and then migrating to deployment makes it uh, quite developer friendly. Um, I alluded a little bit beforehand about the engines, the optimized engines that we build under these models. Um, this is really important because we do a lot of work, which is LLM specific optimization for GPUs um, that uses Tensor T, which, which you might be, be familiar with, which is um, an open source tool that we offer uh, for optimizing models. Um, but if you look here on the right hand side, we have um, just a, a sample of some of the strategies that we use to optimize models. So KV caching is very important. As you know, LLMs all use attention. And if we're able to cache the, the attention data, um, we can really save a lot as far as GPU memory and, and improve uh, performance as far as runtime. As far as parallelization strategies, a single large language model could be paralyzed in many, many different ways, um, even on the same GPUs. Um, so if we want it to be more latency sensitive or throughput sensitive, uh, we'll use a different strategy. And we handle all that under the hood. And then in-flight batching is another uh, popular technique, uh, which we implement so that if we use batching, we don't wait until all the various requests end, but rather we're able to make use of batches of different sizes, uh, which is very common in LLMs, right? Each user uh, asks a, a request of different number of tokens. So naturally we want to make use of that. Another important point um, is that the NIMs are not limited to text. Um, so we have visual nibs, we have embeddings, speech, and even healthcare. Um, so we're not just limited to a specific domain. Um, they all use the same mechanism, which I described before with as far as architecture and so on. And um, one of the handy things is that you can run this really with a single uh, Docker command. So you're able to just run this with a uh, single line. Again, you could do the same on Kubernetes if you like. What we do is we first pull this NIM container uh, the first time uh, you run the command. So let's say for th this is the first time I'm writing, uh, specifically here I run a Llama 3 8B instruct. I pull the container from um, our catalog. And then before I launch, I detect the hardware that's running on your machine. Um, I mount the cache and assets. So again, we spoke a little bit about the lower tuned models. So if we have a lower adapter, then we cache that. And then we attempt to download um, the most, um, the perfect fit for the specific hardware and for the model as well. Um, so again, one of the problems when, when you go to production is first choosing the GPU that's best for you, your use case, but also making sure uh, for my use case, am I more interested in latency or in throughput? And you'll need to optimize the model uh, for each of these. So what this is what happens under the hood automatically is we first detect what GPU architecture is under the hood. And then we detect how many GPUs are available. And then um, you can input whether throughput or latency is more important. You can also use more advanced um, parameters like say what the precision is, right? So very often we run these in FP16. A lot of data scientists are not even familiar with this. By default, you run in floating point uh, 32, 32-bit um, 32 floating point. And um, if you just quantize to FP16, then you get almost a 2x performance boost. Um, so a lot of the, these, this and many more parameters are handled automatically under the hood. And then we load the most uh, compatible profile uh, for, the, for this hardware. 
for the hardware that's running. And we get um, some really nice results. Um, here are just a couple of examples. So on Llama 3, 8B instruct, when we use the NIM versus just a vanilla version of the same model, we get a 3X improvement in throughput. Uh, as I mentioned, we also have embedding. So if we look at an embedding uh, model tuned uh, based on Mistral 7B, then we get a 2X improvement. And this is just out the box, right? Without uh, doing any additional work, any optimization, just running these, these NIMs out the box, I get these optimizations for free. Uh, so this is a great benefit and really allows you to uh, focus on your application rather than on uh, which GPU do I need to handle and how do I profile for GPUs, how do I optimize GPUs, and so on. And as I mentioned before, one of the key points is that you can uh, just deploy this out the box and you don't need to worry about setting up the whole system uh, for that as well. Finally, I want to talk about our NIM agent blueprints. Um, so if we take these NIMs and then we take it to the next level, and let's say we want to deploy multiple NIMs and run a multi-agent system. So we have these reference applications in the same API catalog that I mentioned before, and we're adding more and more. So um, they span a lot of different uh, use cases and you could use this as reference code. It's fully open source. Um, you can use it to further cost, customize uh, the use case and just take it out of the box and use it in production. And this comes with sample data and example applications as well. So that's just to touch on one that's, I think, quite relevant for this forum. If we want to build a RAG, uh, which is a bit more complex than the standard RAG, let's say we want to do a multimodal RAG and we want to include um, some graphs as well as images and run uh, information on that. So here on the bottom, we have the, the flow to, to build um, the vector database, and each one of these green logos is a separate NIM. So we can use an object detection NIM to find images, and then we can run dplot to take images of graphs and extract the text data. And then we have the text in the PDF itself as well, and all that goes uh, into an embedding. We can also maintain different vector stores, but in this reference app, it's all in a single vec vector store. And then as a user, I go and run a query. I run that query through an embedding, and then um, I just have a typical RAG application that I can build uh, using this reference app, but I've already uh, amplified an, an improvement uh, uh, so that it's multimodal. So these blueprints are all available um, in the same API catalog, and they essentially showcase how to use multiple NIMs in a full end-to-end -end application uh, system. So that's it for my, my section. And then Yaron will continue from here on our joint work uh, in, of integrating NIMS into ML Run. Thank you so, so much, Amit. That was fantastic, really interesting. Um, I see that we received a, <clears throat> excuse me, a question in the live Q&A. We'll get that, um, we'll get that, uh, we'll get to that a little bit later. Now we're just gonna take a very quick break and we are going to launch the first poll. Um, <clears throat> here we go. So. If you don't mind taking a minute and just answering the question, where are you on your Gen AI journey? Uh, are you just learning about Gen AI? Do you have a specific use case? Have you begun building a Gen AI app? Are you looking to move your Gen AI apps to production beyond the POC stage? Um, or are you building multiple apps at scale? And without further ado, I'm handing it over to you, Yaron. So thanks. Uh... Amit and, and Edith, and um, I'll cover the additional areas of how we integrate with NVIDIA and, and all the different aspects of building an end-to-end -end application. And then uh, Guy will show us a great demo of com combining NIMS into a full full blown application stack. Uh, so the, bef before we, we dive into that, we talk a lot about LLNs, models, and so on. Uh, when we build projects with, uh, with our clients on Gen AI, most of the challenges are actually not the LLM itself. It's about uh, data management. It's about you know getting to the right accuracy, reducing the risks, uh, scaling costs, and so on. All those different things that need to be addressed. And this is where some of the orchestration techniques and automation and other uh, things we provide uh, come into play. So let's next. So the when if you look at into the left, this is typically what you need to do to build 
a Gen AI application. You start by exploring the data, building the ingestion pipeline for the, the data in, in order to be used as part of a RAG or, or other application. You build a Gen AI application flow with the agents or sometimes multi-agents and, and various stages of this application pipeline. Uh, you also need to build some front end if, if it's a chat and maybe in some cases you'll fine tune the model to even make it better. But these are more the logical steps that you need to do in order, but in order to really productize an application, you need to do also all the things on the, the right. And these are the harder ones to, to challenge because you can build a very quick prototype with those items on the left, but in order to really productize the solution, it takes a lot more efforts and different engineering skills and so on where we roughly categorize it to do three different buckets. One is around data management, security, and governance. This is where you'd need to deal with documents that have been changed, with regulatory compliance aspects, with authentication and access control, making sure everything is safe, there are guardrails, there are no hallucinations, and so on. There's another segment, which is where people build application, you have to build CICD, you need, you need to develop the application the right way with different abstractions so you can develop one thing on your laptop and then scale it out on a cluster or move it from one environment to, to another. You need to address all the aspects of containers, microservices, elastic scaling, metering, logging, and so on. And finally, there is what we refer to as live operation, which is managing the application as it works, You know, deploying the application, doing rolling upgrades, doing rollbacks if the application doesn't perform, uh, doing all sorts of metering and monitoring to identify challenges, uh, chargebacks, and so on. So all those different things need to be addressed in production, and that's quite a lot of, of work. One interesting thing is most of those things could be reused across different projects. You don't have to develop them once every time you build a new project. You can build them once for multiple projects, and with the right abstractions, you can essentially build 100 projects with the same infrastructure that is used to productize those. And next slide. So also the way we break down the Gen AI application, we talked about it in the past, is the four main categories. One is around the data management, so taking raw data, building a set of transformation, cleaning the data, chunking the data, removing duplicates, removing uh, private data, and so on, structuring it, and finally writing it into sort of a vector database or another form of, of data store. And here we also need to think about the fact that data keeps on evolving, there are new updates and so on, so take care of all the lifecycle aspects of the data. Uh, the second segment of model development and testing is taking the model validating the model along with the prompt that it's really producing the anticipated results. And uh, and here, some cases we'll fine tune a model to make it even better. In some cases, we will take the model as is, but we still need to run evaluation and testing and deployment and because a new version of a model may break our application. So we need to do all of that. Uh, the next step is the application deployment where the, usually the application intercepts some sort of request and contextualize it with data from various database, does some prompt engineering, some prediction using an LLM and some post-processing. Obviously there are way more advanced applications with multi-agents and classification and branching and so on, but this is the basic use case. And the final step is collecting the telemetry from the application and by uh, applying the different monitoring techniques, uh, validate the accuracy, the performance, validate there's no risks in the application, and that information can actually be fed back into the testing and fine-tuning flow. So this is the general flow of those applications. Uh, next slide. So when it comes to the collaboration between NVIDIA and Iguazio and our open source project called ML Run, uh, what we, we just saw from Amit was the NIM technology is essentially a pre-baked container. And that container has a lot of capabilities. It could be the LLM itself, it could be tricks around improving performance, micro-batching, caching, and so on, uh, and telemetry, and so on. But then you need to deploy that container on a cluster, or maybe even multiple containers on multiple systems with multiple GPUs 
on that cluster and elastically scale it up, scale it down. You need to apply metering. Uh, if you build a model or fine tune the model, you need to run a full pipeline, ML pipeline for preparing the data, fine tuning the model, storing it in a model registry and so on. So all of those different things require orchestration. And part of what it was in the ML run project, which behind this technology does is all of those different things. And now it's also integrated pretty well with uh, NIMS and Guy is going to show us in a demo how we can essentially orchestrate NIMS, do auto scaling for NIMS, do telemetry for NIMS, do uh, fine tuning and so on, all of that and metering and monitoring around NIMS, which complements the story and allows you to get production worthy solution combining the great technology from NVIDIA with you know, uh, optimized NIMS with the best performance and the best features uh, along with orchestration we, we provide through them around open source project or through a Guazi solution, which is now part of McKinsey. So these are the different capabilities that you'll find in, in Amelran and Iguazio. And next slide. And another thing that we've been building also internally within McKinsey for the internal uh, McKinsey users, but also for uh, McKinsey clients is what we refer to as a Gen AI factory. So taking those different technologies like MLRAN, like vector databases, like Milvus, uh, names for NVIDIA and so on, and building a way for organization to have a, a portal where the data scientists can just start building those applications without all the hassle uh, around it. So we build those solutions, sometimes even with a, a pretty cool UI and UX like the one you're seeing here, which is used internally uh, for us. And you have all those different services pre-provisioned on the cluster, and along with all the lifecycle aspects of a Gen AI project, anywhere from data management to uh, fine-tuning models to serving models to interacting with uh, service models like OpenAI and so on. Uh, also, the integration around NIM and NIMO, uh, chargebacks, monitoring, telemetry, all of that is engineered into that solution. It's all based on open source, and we can work with the uh, with the different people, how they, they can augment what they already have with that technology, or we could just show them how we build it and they'll build it themselves. Uh, next slide. Behind the scene, this is the architecture, how this thing is built. It can run either on-prem, anyone that has some uh, Kubernetes and object store, uh, even on DGX from NVIDIA. Uh, or it could run on the cloud on any cloud platform, you know, Azure, Google, Amazon, even there's an integration over Databricks. And then essentially you, what you create is a sandbox for every application or every user where you have all the accessible uh, microservices for that, uh, for doing the fine tuning, for doing the serving, for the databases. And this is sort of an a la carte. Every user chooses his own set of components. Some may want to have some something like Spark or Kafka if they do a lot of data engineering. Some others will choose other services. But this is the generalized architecture. We've seen a lot of our clients building their what we call Gen AI or AI factory, which is a platform for building multiple use cases on that cluster. Uh, next slide. Uh, one of the nice thing about the way ML run and uh, other serverless engines uh, work is they can attach a lot of telemetry to those containers. So you can see in real time who's consuming what, how many GPUs are used for each individual project, for each individual user. Uh, and based on that, you can build things like chargeback. You can say, okay, this uh, department or this application need to be charged because they're using such and such GPUs or CPUs and so on uh, over time. And also nice for troubleshooting and identifying uh, problems with applications. Uh, next. Uh, one, this is an example of how to build a real world application and, and Guy will show us a demo in a, in a second, a real world Gen AI application. So usually we have those different layers in the solution. The underlying layer is the data layer. So you can have uh, all those different data assets that are used in the application. And the data assets, some of them are used for like application data, like uh, uh, features, a vector database will store some chunks uh, refer to the application uh, data. There are some things like, uh, you know, the microservices configuration, the metadata, uh, the prompts database with, where you can actually store prompts in a database instead of making it hardwired in the code. And so you can modify it and track it. Uh, things like the session history, because you need to maintain some sort of a cache of the conversation. 
uh, and but there's also operational data like monitoring, logging, and so on. All of that needs to be stored somewhere. It could be regular databases or cloud databases, and we work with many different options here. The next layer of, above is the container orchestration uh, system. This is where you will also orchestrate GPUs, CPUs, and so on. And on top of that, you'll have the application flow. The application flow usually has this uh, flow that you can see here, you know, the, you intercept the request, uh, you do some authentication, do some pre-processing, you take the request, you identify what is it trying to do, based on that you pass it to an agent or a tool uh, or a rag system, and then you do some post-processing. Uh, this uh, application will talk to an LLM, so there are two types of LLMs, one is what we call LLM, LLM service, like OpenAI, you just make an API call. And another thing is what we call LLM server, which is essentially hosting the LLM. In this case, NIM uh, will be used in, in the demo. And, and all those models may be stored in a model registry of some sort. And there's also a fine tuning pipeline that may keep on updating the model. And then again, every time there's a new update of the model after fine tuning or after RLHF and after some feedback, we can serve a new model and then get the application to work with it. One uh, critical element here is that we, what we do also is a lot of blueprints and components. So instead of building every application from scratch, all those blue boxes that you see here, we have a library of those. A lot of it is open source as well. And we just stitch those components together. And this is way, this way we can spin an application with, uh, within a matter of uh, days. So that's the general architecture of how we, we built it. Uh, next. So with that, we'll move to Guy. He'll show us a full demo of using uh, NIMS and building a full end-to-end -end application with MRUN uh, and NIMS. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Let me show my screen. So uh, in this demo, we are going to see uh, how uh, uh, we're going to use uh, NIM uh, with MLRAN and how MLRAN allows us to uh, use NIMs with a production first mindset and uh, MLOps best practices. We are going to use the NIM uh, to build a multi-agent uh, banking chatbot. So let's begin. Uh, we are going to use uh, MLRAN and uh, LangChain uh, as our framework of choice. Uh, so we have some of the prerequisites. We're going to create an MLRAN project. And now, how to deploy a NIM with MLRAN? So deploying a NIM with MLRAN is very easy. MLRAN has an application runtime, which can take any image and simply uh, serve it as a serv serverless function. And NIM uh, is no uh, strange to that. So we are going to create a NIM application uh, we're going to give it a, a name. We're going to choose the model. In this scenario, we're going to use Llama 3 8 billion instruct, and we're going to provide it the API key. This API key is going to be uh, set as a secret and so on, everything automatically. I click deploy, and now I get a name that is uh, fully uh, auto-scalable and all the good stuff. Uh, we can hit invoke and we can see I asked it, what is the capital of Great Britain? And after a long answer, I got London, which is great. So how to use a name? We are going to use the name uh, to build an intent uh, classification step uh, in our banking uh, chatbot. So we want uh, our banking chatbot to have, it will have three agents. So we have agent that is in charge of loans, another one on investments, and another for uh, other casual talk. Uh, so uh, we want to build an intent classification to actually send the message to the right agent. So uh, I built here uh, some classic prompts. Uh, it's, it probably is not the best, but it's good for the uh, demonstration here. Uh, we are going to use uh, the NVIDIA LLM from uh, LangChain. This is uh, how NIM is integrated into LangChain. Uh, we are going to give it our NIM application URL, uh, the model to use, and uh, we are going to build uh, our prompt template from the prompt. And to test it, we are going to hit invoke and 
I asked it, I needed 250,000 uh, US dollar to open a restaurant. What option do I have? And it classified it as a loan, which is great. So now how do I operationalize a NIM using MLRAN? So MLRAN uh, provide us great way uh, and very easily to uh, uh, enable MLOps to the NIM that we just served. First of all, we are going to have an LLM gateway. What is an LLM gateway? MLRAN uh, have a, a built-in gateway that we can use. And through this gateway, we can uh, use a self-hosted model or even any model provider like OpenAI, Coherent Topic. In this scenario, we are going to, to use NIM and OpenAI for the monitoring, which are going to uh, talk soon. Uh, why should I use the LLM gateway? Well, first of all, it enables us 100% uh, modularity. I don't need to go to the code of my chain and, uh, and, and edit it because I can just configure it from outside and I can then choose and play with every model uh, on demand. For example, if I, if I have to reduce cost, for example, if I want to use a stronger model on some, uh, on some request, I can just tweak it and uh, use uh, on the same uh, gateway another model. And another thing is that usually for monitoring, which is very important aspect of uh, MLOps, uh, LLM monitoring is quite different because model monitoring uh, in classic ML and deep learning solutions, you would monitor the model because every model will have uh, basically one use case, maybe two. LLM, because of the prompt, enable us to uh, use a single model with multiple use cases. So it's very important to not only monitor the model, but monitor each use case. So what it enables us to do it is we are going to use the same gateway with different labels, and then we can actually, even if we choose a different model for the same use case, I can monitor per use case, I can monitor per model, and I can monitor in general the entire application. So how to do it? Very simple. We are going to set a function. It is the uh, model server, and we are going to add uh, our model there. And we simply, uh, so here I'm testing it and turning it to a mock server. I'm testing it here on the notebook. Uh, uh, I. I sent it hello, I see hello, it's nice to meet you. Uh, and now we're going to enable the monitoring. So to monitor, we are going to use uh, uh, our built-in model as a judge, monitor application. You can write your own applications as well, uh, but for this demo, we're going to use uh, the LLM as a judge. If you want to learn more about LLM as a judge, we have another uh, demo as available in GitHub. Uh, so I'm not going to talk so much, but uh, this is our, going to be our prompt for the judge. It is basically telling it, the judge what is goal, uh, how to score uh, the incoming elements, uh, and uh, some few shot uh, classification for uh, the prompt. We are going to set in the project our mo model uh, monitoring function, which is our application. So we can see LLM is a judge application. Then we're going to deploy the function, and then we're going to deploy our gateway. Everything is deployed. And now I want to use my gateway instead of the NVIDIA uh, in LangChain. Again, it's very simple. All we have to do is change the NVIDIA LLM class into MLRAN class. And it receives our MLRAN function. So this is the only change. It receives the model name and the label to actually monitor specific use case. I will reconstruct the chain with our new LLM and I'm going to test it in a, on a data set that we have. And I see uh, we scored about 87%. So our prompt is not great, but it's not terrible. Now I want my judge to actually score. Uh, I want to see how the judge that we monitor, how he scored the model. So happily, our prompt for the judge is very strong and the judge itself is based on OpenAI. So we can see that the judge actually scored it almost identically to the ground truth. So the judge scored it about 86% and the ground truth is 87%. So I know my judge is monitoring my model very good. 
Uh, so after that, uh, Yaron talked about the Gen AI factory. So we want to take our intent classifier into an actual application. And again, it is very simple. What we're going to do is we're going to wrap it in a class, which is called a chain runner. We're going to copy the entire uh, code to the run of method of this class. And whatever component we want to be automatically tracked and configurable, we are going to put in the init. So uh, this intent classifier is going to be a reusable component. I don't want it uh, to be just for banking. So it receives the classifier classes and it will class based on the, uh, the configurable classes that it receives. Again, uh, the prompt template is also trackable and can configurable and the LLM as well. So uh, this is going to be part of our uh, workflow. The workflow uh, is, uh, this is the intent classification connected to the agent. And this is how the workflow looks like. So we have the session loader, we have a refined query to uh, make it shorter with the history of the uh, chat. Then we have our intent classifier. Uh, we have a choice that is connected to all the agents. And we have a history saver to actually keep, uh, keep track of the entire conversation. We add the workflow to the server and then we can just uh, deploy it. So I prepare in advance uh, the actual uh, conversation I have with the bot. So we can see here, uh, I'm going to ask him, what can you do for me? And this is the general agent. Uh, it will answer about all the agents that are connected to it and uh, what it can do. So general banking, loans, and investments. Now I'm going to uh, ask him about, uh, I think I want to, yeah, I want to buy a house. Uh, what type of investment uh, do you have? Uh, so now the uh, loan, uh, Oh, wait a second. Oh, so now the investment is going to take charge and not the loan. And yes, this is because I asked it, I'm planning to buy a house. What can you say about the terms of the investment? So it could go to a loan, but it classified it correctly. And we can see it actually uh, uh, told me what is very important in purchasing a house as an investment, location, market research, and so on. Then I, I asked him, what kind of loan can I take to buy a house? Uh, he will tell me the most common loan is a mortgage. Excellent. So you can see it is a mortgage loan. And I'm going to go back to the investment agent. I'm going to ask him uh, what type of other investment uh, does he recommend? And you can see he has stocks, bonds, and more stuff. So that's basically it. Uh, I hope you had fun in this uh, webinar. And Edith, back to you. Thank you so much, Guy, on your own. That was really fantastic. Um, we're going to take one quick moment and share the second poll. And then we're going to dive into the q and I see there's a lot of questions. So without further ado, I'm going to launch the second poll. Um, this is a new question for those who have attended previous uh, MLOPSI webinar sessions. Where are you deploying or planning to deploy your Gen AI applications? Please do take a minute, and this is a multiple choice uh, question, so please pick all of those that apply to you. All right, fantastic. Thank you to everyone that took the minute to answer that. Okay. Um, so without further ado, um, Ami and Guy and Yaron, if you are able to turn on your camera so everyone can see your face. And um, wow, there are a lot of questions here. Um, okay, so there's a question here about security specifically for the enterprise. 
Um, so who wants to take a moment and talk about enterprise data security, what you're supposed to do to ensure um, optimal security when using generative AI? You run maybe? Or a meet? <laughs> yeah, um, so I can just uh, address it from a NIM perspective. So one of the um, challenges is really once we're on a cloud system um, and we have certain privacy restrictions, it's a problem, right? Because you have to understand that if you have, let's say, medical data or any um, data that's personally identifiable, we don't want to use chat GPT or open AI because, right, you're just essentially sharing that data um, with a provider. Um, and on, from the NIM perspective, once we deploy these systems, we use the self-deploy model, that's one of the advantages of that type of flow is because we essentially we have full control over the information that's flowing through the uh, LLM. Uh, yeah, I think another point around security, uh, uh, beyond the LLM itself, uh, what you've seen in the pipeline that I showed, there's a sort of first step of sort of authentication. Uh, what we're doing as part of the this uh, framework that Guy showed is also maintaining the user context. So if this specific request goes to data, we can authenticate and also do access control to guarantee that a certain request from a certain person doesn't go to the wrong data or doesn't have the wrong credentials to access that data. Thanks. Thanks, Iran. Um, there was a question here, Guy, what was the size of the data in this example? And um, someone also asked about the difference between the MLRN chat that you showed versus chat GPT. Maybe you could take a minute and explain the differences there. Uh, of course. So the size of the data set is uh, fairly small. It was just, you know, for the for the demo, just to test the prompt, it was, I think, about 100 examples of just uh, questions and uh, the label of what they are about. Uh, the ChatGPT interface and the MLRAN chat you saw, uh, it, it's, its purpose is to, to do the same. I mean, it's just to interact with the, the LLM. Of course, ChatGPT offers much more, uh, you know, features. You can uh, upload an image and so on. But we uh, we plan to develop the MLRAN chat uh, UI to actually enable all of this stuff and to make it also uh, uh, edit uh, in the components. So you can uh, maybe see as a, a co-pilot uh, um, UI, if you want to chat UI, maybe you want an anal analysis UI for a batch work with LLM. Uh, so that, that's the yeah, thing. Maybe to highlight the, the UI that you've seen them run uh, chat UI is essentially an open source UI framework that we wrote that a lot of our clients are taking that and then customizing it to their needs. The chat GPT is a canned application. It's you don't you can't touch it. But if you want to build your own chat, but you need to invest in fr in front end development and so on. So uh, we together with UX people in McKinsey and so on, we build this uh, framework that you can just take it, change colors, change some things and you have a full blown application. Thanks, Yaron. Um, Amit, I see that there were a bunch of questions that you already answered um, during the live session. Was there something that you wanted to expand upon um, that you think would be relevant for the whole audience? Um, yeah, so I I have I put I put in links for those. Uh, um, so on the question of Langchain and API in general, so I, I mentioned that we support OpenAI. Uh, we also support um, uh, Llama Stack if you're familiar with that, and we support Langchain and Llama Index. NIM is not a replacement for Langchain or Llama Index. You can think of it as an endpoint, right? So you have the LLM endpoints that you connect into Langchain for orchestration. Think of NIM as another endpoint for that, and I put a link uh, for that question uh, as well. There was another question on embeddings. So um, just to clarify, the embeddings are separate NIMs. It's basically a parallel universe to Hugging Face, right? So just as in Hugging Face, you have retrieval um, models and you have large language models uh, that address text. The same happens in API catalog. So we have separate a separate embedding NIM, a re-rank NIM, uh, and so on. We just released a new embedding NIM um, a couple of days ago based on Llama 3.2. 
again, the, the I put in the link so you can uh, explore that further. Thanks, Amit. Um, there are some very specific questions here um, that were asked in the Q&A. So um, I do encourage you to ask Guy. He's also in the Slack community. Um, post the questions there and we'll make sure to answer those as well. Um, I see here that um, there's a question about, we've, we received this a lot, um, about how to manage and optimize costs when deploying generative AI in production. There's a lot of optimization that you can do, but not sure, Yaron, if you want to kind of talk a little bit about that. Yes, I, I think there are two aspects. One is dealt within the name itself of Ruin NVIDIA by uh, really optimizing the the use of the GPU through those different techniques, applying caching, applying different compression techniques and so on, that's one thing. Uh, the other one is really around resource management, which is where MRN comes into play with this notion of auto scaling. For example, if you're not using, it will shrink the microservice. If you're using a lot of it, then it will actually start increasing the amount of microservices ser serving that application. The same when you're doing jobs like fine tuning or data, a pipeline and so on. All the resources are provisioned ad hoc and then decommissioned, which reduces significant amount of resources. Uh, and there are, again, a lot of different tricks applied to, to do parallelization, micro batching and so on to reduce the, the cost of the infrastructure. We've seen anywhere from 50% saving to 80% saving just by um, doing that sort of uh, smart resource allocation. Thank you so much. Um, we are running out of time, so I do want to take a minute to um, share the poll results. Um, let me go ahead and go back to the first poll. So when looking at everyone that joined us tonight, where you are in your Gen AI journey, um, there's 45% of you are just learning about Gen AI. So in a minute, I'll talk about some resources that you can look at. And Amit also shared some. Um, there are 18% that have a specific use case. 16% of you are looking to move your Gen AI app to production on the POC stage, which is fantastic. Um, your own spoke about scaling. 13% um, you've begun building a Gen AI app and 8% need to build multiple apps at scale. So it's nice to see um, where you all are on your Gen AI journey. And to the second question, uh, where are you deploying or planning to deploy your Gen AI applications? We can see 43% AWS, 30% um, on-premises, 26% uh, Azure, 17% um, tied for GCP, and I don't know, and 20% hybrid. So it's nice to see um, where you're deploying or where you're planning on deploying your Gen AI applications, the mix here is great to see. Um, so I wanted to take, um, I wanted to take a quick second to invite you all to visit our website, um, at aguazio.com. You can explore previous sessions of this webinar, of our webinar series at your convenience. This is our 33rd session. So there is a lot um, of information and resources and blogs and best practices and case studies that you can find on our website. And Amit also shared some links, which I will include um, in the follow-up email tomorrow. Um, so do take, feel free to take a look and we'd love to hear your feedback. Um, before saying goodbye to all of you, I just wanted to take a moment and extend a huge thank you to Amit and your own and Guy for your fantastic presentations. It was very, very interesting and applicable and learned a lot from this session. And I wanted to take a second to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy days to come here and listen and ask great questions and um, participate in our, in our webinar. We truly appreciate you joining us and we look forward to having you in our next session. So thank you all for joining us and stay tuned for the next MLOps Live webinar. And don't forget to join our uh, Slack community to continue the conversation. Thank you all so much. Have a great day.